Hey, my name is Pat Race. I'm down in Juneau. I'm a filmmaker and an illustrator, and I support uh, Ballot Measure 2. And so I just wanted to talk about that a little bit and uh, provide some uh, visual explanation of it uh, for anyone that might still be on the fence. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. We can just walk through it real quick. All right. So uh, this is a ranked choice ballot, and you've got uh, column here for your first choice, second choice, third choice, and fourth choice. And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to decide that this caribou is our first, first choice. Um, you know, this bear, this guy's great. Like if, if I can't get the candidate I want, this is the, this is the one I'll, I'll take. Um, and then, uh, you know, the Eagles, not my favorite, but let's put him down here at three and that salmon's a little suspect. He's been out in the sun too long. Call him number four. All right. So that's uh, that's how it goes. You know, it's really easy. I think people like to, um, you know, when they're criticizing ranked choice voting, they say it's too complicated. It's not very complicated. Uh, this is something we can do kind of some minimal education on and get people up to speed on pretty quickly. So not worried about that. Uh, argument that it's too complicated. Um, thinking about like how it works, that's a little more tricky. So rank choice is uh, uses like instant runoff is probably something you've heard. And the way that works is you can think of, you know, your four votes, my four votes that I just made as kind of a stack of, uh, here's my, there's my vote stack. So each one of these represents someone's stack of choices. There's my stack of choices. And this is the, uh, now we're tallying up the election. And so generally what you want is for a candidate to get across a 50% threshold um, to, to, to win the election. But we don't have a winner now. So we've got these five bears. They need some more votes to win. Uh, I'm sorry, Caribou. I really wanted you to win, but you only got two number one votes. So we throw those Caribou vo votes away. We peel off that top vote and we see what the second vote is. My second vote was that bear. It's gonna go up and jump in the bear line. Someone else voted for the salmon. So now we've got kind of neck and neck here between the bear and the salmon. Uh, the eagle's not gonna win this one. So peel back those eagle votes and see what their number two is. We've got a bear and another bear and we've got another salmon. And so you can see now that that bear has crossed that threshold and is, uh, is winning, wins the, wins the election. Congratulations. You win, Mr. Bear, you are the winner. All right. So, um, so yeah, one of the, one of the things I like about this is that, uh, it gives us a preference, you know, like it gives us a way to say, if my candidate doesn't win, I would like this other candidate to win. Um, it cleans up some of the problems we've had in the last elections with spoilers. We've had, um, you know, going back to Miller Murkowski McAdams or uh, Dunleavy Baggage Walker, there's, you know, so often we have candidates that undercut each other. Um, and pretty soon we're just arguing with each other about uh, which candidate should drop out uh, instead of talking about the issues that really matter. And, you know, and then we're not in a good spot. So one of the things I have a problem with is like, I am, I am a nonpartisan voter in Alaska. Um, and uh, I'm part of this giant orange or giant yellow chunk here. 63% of registered voters in Alaska are undeclared, nonpartisan, um, libertarian, Green Party, all these all these little parties and and non parties. And then you've got 13% of the voters that are Democrat and 24% are Republican. But in Alaska, this is what our legislature looks like. So uh, our state government is 37% Democrat, 60% Republican, and 3% other. And that's a very thin slice of the pie considering how many people identify that way. So it would be really interesting to have a system that opens up the legislature to not just be driven by party interests, but by citizen interests, by the interests of this huge 63% of, of underrepresented Alaskans. So um, uh, let's talk about the um, primaries or the, uh, yeah, the open primary. So right now, uh, what ballot measure two would do is it would open up the uh, primary election so that you can vote on uh, a bunch of candidates, a whole whole wide range of them. And right now you have to, if, if you're like me, if you're a Democrat, you just get this Democrat ballot. If you're Republican, you get the Republican ballot. If you're like me, a nonpartisan voter, you get to choose between one of these two ballots. And it's a really horrible choice because uh, I live in Juneau. Uh, it's a pretty blue district in a red state. And so 
I'm, I have to make this decision. Am I going to vote in like state house races or state Senate races? Uh, you know, make a decision on which candidate emerges from that primary, uh, or am I going to vote on, 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 you know, who's running in the Republican primary for governor or something like that? Um, you know, where, where a Republican might go on to win. And oftentimes these decisions that we make in the primaries really decide the election. You know, we've seen a ton of elections where there's a close race in the primary and then a blowout in the general election. And because of that, we're, we're basically handing off control of, of our government to these small factions within the, within the parties. So, um, so as an independent voter, not thrilled with the current uh, layout of the primary elections. And I think that opening up the primary election would be a lot better for everyone. Um, the other group of people that this is really bad for is candidates. Uh, any independent candidate right now uh, has a really hard path to get into legislatures. Part of why this graph, why there's so much disparity here. So right now, if you're an independent candidate, you straight up can't run in the Republican primary. It's just not allowed. You have to be a registered Republican to run in the Republican primary and uh, you see how welcoming they are if you change your party affiliation uh, right before the election. Um, so the other option, you can run in the Democrat primary as a, as, as a nonpartisan or undeclared uh, candidate. Uh, the problems there you run into is, is you're perceived as an outsider or an infiltrator. You're replacing Democrats on the ballot. Uh, you might not align with the party. Um, you know, it's really frustrating for people who are Democrats to see their, see their candidates get bumped out in favor of these, um, you know, nonpartisan candidates. Uh, and so I can, I can understand that frustration. The other problem is that it's a more progressive slice of the electorate. So if you are a more moderate independent and you're running in the Democratic primary, uh, chances are pretty good that you're just going to straight up lose. And so, um, so that's not always the most strategic path to victory. Um, now, if you're an independent, another thing you can do is just skip the primaries altogether and you can run in the general election. The problem with that, of course, is that you don't get to warm up your engine. You're not, you're not coming out of the primary with a victory. Uh, no one really knows who you are because you haven't been part of the discussion. You haven't been part of the advertising campaigns. And so there's no primary visibility for you. Um, and you're really untested at, at that stage. So it's very difficult to kind of like come into this race where you've got two candidates, probably a Republican and Democrat candidate coming out of their primaries that have got their stride, they figured out what they're doing, and now you're just stepping into this election. Um, the other problem is you're going to be perceived as a spoiler. So now you come in and you're the third candidate in a, in a, in a, in a race, and uh, you're going to be stealing votes from the candidate that you're most aligned with. And, and again, it turns to that argument of like who should drop out. And that's not a productive discussion. We should really be talking about policy and you know why each candidate is going to be good for Alaska. Um, yeah, so another concern... Um, I've heard uh, is kind of with the, with the primary system. How does the primary work? How does a top four primary work? A top four primary is um, it functions like the elections we we know and have today. Um, and, and the top four vote getters go on to that move on to that general election with the ranked choice ball ballot. So if this is a primary election and this is let's say this top part here, this is our um, you know, this is our political spectrum for this district. Each one of those dashes represents a voter. So we've got some Republicans. This is a pretty conservative district. We've got a couple independents. Um, we've got some Democrats and we've got a Green Party guy just hanging out there at the end. So how's, how's this voting going to work? Uh, let's say these three people here want to vote for candidate D and these three people are going to vote for candidate F and these... Uh, ooh, how friendly are we? He's going to get a couple Republicans there. And then candidate D, she's going to get three, can't, three uh, votes. And candidate C is unloved, gets one vote. Candidate B gets two votes. And candidate A gets a vote. Uh, gets two votes. Uh, let's start that over. Gets two votes. Okay. And so now what happens is we, so we look at this and we see the top vote getters are gonna go on to the general election. And then where we're having our, um, you know, ranked choice voting, which is wonderful. So, okay, so the interesting thing about this and the fear that I wanna address is that, you know, your candidate won't get out of the primary. First of all, if your candidate uh, is worth their salt, they'll probably get out of the primary. Um, it's unlikely, right now, we rarely have primaries that have, you know, six 
eight, 10 <laughs> candidates in them. It would be great. It would be awesome if we had that many people running for office. Um, but in this scenario here, we're in a conservative district. Uh, let's say you're a Democrat and you're worried that you won't see any Democrats on the ballot. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to rig this so that only Republicans, so only these four Republicans go. And we're going to see that it's pretty hard. So we're going to give candidate A three votes. We're going to give candidate B three votes. We're going to give candidate C three votes. And we're going to give candidate D a couple votes here. We're going to even steal one of those independents. And then we're going to give candidate E a couple of votes. We're trying to spread these out really equally so that this these guys lose. Oops, that'll have to be a two. And then all of a sudden, like, see, we still have. It's it's really hard to make it so that your um, votes have to be really evenly distributed, and they have to be um, they have to be really unfavorable. Uh, if you're not going to have people from the whole spectrum uh, uh, move on to the general election. So I'm not too worried about people getting um, um, not having representation across the spectrum. And the other thing is that you know ultimately this district is far more conservative than it than it is liberal, and probably um, the best candidate is going to be weighed along that spectrum, um, you know, kind of in in that realm. Um, but now in the general election, instead of having this like sacrificial Democrat go up against a uh, hyper conservative Republican and then end up with this hyper conservative Republican, what you might get is because of ranked choice, you might end up getting a more moderate Republican or maybe even an independent. Um, and the thing that I'm really looking forward to is seeing two two Republicans running against each other in a conservative district and arguing about, you know, which one of them makes the most sense to the Democrats in that district. Cause right now it's really easy to just ignore entire uh, ban color bands on the political spectrum here. Um, but in a, in a ranked choice voting system, you really have to pay attention to all the constituents in your district and you have to serve everyone in your district. Um, what we've seen in other elections, uh, ranked choice voting now is happening in like, uh, I think 20 states. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of those are mun municipal elections. Um, they're not all state elections, but, but, um, but they're, but it's happening more and more. And one of the things that we've seen is candidates will endorse one another. So, you know, you want to get not just all those first place votes, but you want to scoop up those second place votes and those third place votes, just in case it comes down to it. So, you know, as a candidate, um, we're seeing candidates that will endorse one another. So, you know, this bear guy might say, hey, vote for me. Uh, and, you know, if, if you don't vote, if you, if you vote for me, please vote for my friend, the caribou number two, and they might swap endorsements. Um, so you start seeing candidates really um, kind of agreeing with each other more, you know, instead of trying to tear each other down. And those candidates that tear each other down uh, generally get ranked less favorably on the rankings. And so it kind of discourages some of that negative behavior. Um, yeah. So anyways, those are some of the things that I'm excited about. Um, and, uh, you know, it, the dark money component is a, is a thing. I don't think I probably need to spend too much time on. I think that everyone agrees that we need to get, um, you know, get more campaign finance, uh, transparency and, uh, that we want to know what's going on in our elections and who's paying for them. And, you know, who do these, who do, who do candidates work for is a nice, nice question to have answered and to know as we're voting. Um, and even, um, I, I would just end, I'll play this little video clip. Even the opposition to this ballot measure says they would testify in favor of getting dark money out of our elections. As I told, um, Senator Keel at the Juno chamber the other day, if he wants to run a bill on dark money, that will make it easier for Alaskans to understand who's supporting who, I'd be happy to come and testify on its behalf. You know, that is one of the strongest parts of this. I think that we can all agree that we want to have more campaign finance transparency. And I hope that if this ballot measure doesn't pass, I hope that we can all work together to make that happen at least, uh, maybe through the legislative process. So um, vote yes on two and uh, vote, just period, please vote. All right. Thanks. See you later, Alaska.